thank you very much. And uh, my dear guests, uh, my dear uh, friends and followers, all those that are listening to us uh, on the Facebook stream, it is a great pleasure to uh, share with you uh, some thoughts and of course invite our guests into a lively discussion about, for me, one of the most uh, challenging topics, which is how to bring together smart villages and smart uh, cities. Of course, not to forget that the countryside is an essential part of the overall development uh, of our society. And uh, let me briefly share with you some of the thoughts and hopefully we will build on them during the discussion. Uh, as Natasha has already mentioned, you're much you're very welcome to share your questions in the chat, but we will have time to have an open discussion as well. So um, enjoy the ride and uh, let's see how can we contribute to the better understanding of the role of villages in the future, and of course, how to engage in order to make it happen. First of all, what is a smart village? And here I would just like to briefly uh, share with you a definition that's been used uh, in the EU, where we see smart village as a rule, as is a smart village as a place, um, and it's about rural people. Uh, rural people who take the initiative to find practical solutions, both uh, to the downsides and to the exciting new opportunities arising locally. And in order to quickly demonstrate uh, what that really means, I'll share a very short video that really helps us very clearly to position the way how Europe understands uh, smart village. Uh, but that is not necessarily the only way. Uh, so we can, of course, Life challenge this. Life has both its advantages and its downsides. We are not seeing the video, Violeta. It's about rural Please people not. who take the initiative to find practical solutions, both to the downsides and to the exciting new opportunities arising locally. Smart means using every tool available. Violeta, we don't see the video. We don't see the video, Violeta. Sorry? The village itself. We do not see the video. Involve oh. the surrounding countryside groups of villages, Sorry? small towns, and links. If you don't see the video, there is no point of showing it. You would need to simply uh, stop sharing and start sharing again where the video is, because right now all we see is your slides. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't... I'm not, gonna, video. I'm, That's okay. I'm not going to use the time because it's very pressure, but I will invite you then to check this video, which gives us an overview, really focusing on people and uh, the people's needs in the rural area, uh, which of course doesn't mean that this is undeveloped area. This is the area that has uh, equal needs for the future development as cities have except of course that it's much more personal, it's much more uh, engaging because people know each other and they, it's much fast, they are much faster in sharing the ideas once they have a chance, once there is a platform uh, that offers them this kind of opportunities. So today we will discussing this issue uh, and trying to get points of view from different continents from all over the world. That's why it's so, I'm so excited to, to see people from India, Dr. Ashok, as we agree that he wants to be called that way. Then Lambert, who represents not only the Netherlands, but also uh, he is a member of European Forum for Smart Villages, and he will share the European story. Uh, Derek uh, Badzra, who comes from Ghana, and he will share his points of view, especially from the IT perspective. Delfina Terrado Keller, who, who is very much engaged now uh, with the communities and will share uh, with us her perspective and her experiences, and she's coming from Argentina. Chenese Mongoma, who's coming from uh, Zimbabwe, and I really hope she will be able to tap in and join us. 
uh, and she will bring her unique experience, what it means to really leave the whole city life behind and engage on the countryside and try to bring uh, business opportunities uh, to the rural areas of Africa. And Sofia Carvalho, who also is, uh, decided that her life belongs to the life in the rural areas, in the villages and fighting for her uh, space. Uh, and I'm more than happy to uh, invite her to share her story. She comes from Brazil. But above all with us is also Dr. Alexander Laszlo, who is a system thinker, professor, uh, researcher, connector, and uh, I'm very happy that he offers his support uh, to our work as well. He was the one who really brought me into the field of system science and uh, told me what I was doing as an entrepreneur because I didn't know until then. So uh, this is the group will, that will uh, kick off uh, the, the basic ideas and then I hope others will join in and uh, you are all invited to enter this discussion. Uh, the purpose really is of today's session uh, how are, to, to see how are villages perceived in different parts of the world. Are villages evolving or declining in its role? What is the meaning of the world village in today's world? And of course, what is the meaning of smart? Uh, then which are the key challenges and opportunities that villages are facing and, and that we can maybe collectively address? How does your work relate uh, to the development uh, of rural areas? And uh, what are your meaning speakers' experiences in financing the villages? Um, and could the smart village concept be the future uh, for villages uh, altogether? So um, the, at the end, last but not least, how can we connect uh, smart cities and smart villages better? And we've been very much challenged in the pandemic times uh, where we realize that this connection is needed and that uh, we are lacking sufficient and efficient logistic uh, solutions in order to ensure that the cities have a smooth delivery of fresh food and uh, uh, other services that they might need. So why I'm so excited about this because currently 80% uh, of global population lives in the cities. And we know from historical point of view of the last 20,000 years that every pandemic, every pandemic has started in the city. So uh, how can we ensure that the cities which are growing so fast uh, are also safe, that they have the uh, healthy lungs, that they can breathe, that they can actually live uh, a healthy life, uh, but at the same time, how can we connect them better with the villages and hopefully make countryside also more attractive uh, for uh, the especially young people to stay and to develop uh, their life in the countryside. In Europe, that statistic is slightly, let's say better, is 63% of citizens live uh, in the cities. For the country I know best, Slovenia, that is uh, even lower number. We have 50-50%. We are very small, so it's actually altogether one huge uh, area, uh, which you in many countries call city. But uh, we have a very uh, lively development of rural areas, and uh, that started to pay off. And we learned that, especially in these critical times. So. Um, just briefly how the day will go. Uh, first, uh, we will hear all the speakers from different parts of the world. Uh, and then uh, I will ask also the speakers that they intervene with each other with possible questions or comments or additional explanations. And then uh, we will have uh, Professor Laz, uh, Alexander to uh, give us the overview. What did he hear and what uh, where did he see the systemic leverage points or possible uh, systemic uh, elements that we can start building uh, a big global picture based on these um, understandings? And then, of course, uh, reflections from the audience with all the questions. Um, and it, at the end, we will have a little wrap up. So that's uh, basically the day. Um, I would just quickly uh, run through a couple of more points. Um, 
the definition, why am I saying the EU and mentioning it so many times? Because uh, I was privileged to be part of the uh, European Commission's team uh, that launched the concept of smart village, understanding that if we want to really have a, a balanced development, uh, especially uh, in, on the social level, on uh, business level, and uh, overall, we need to have a balanced development of uh, rural and uh, urban areas. And uh, we realized that uh, villages are a great asset and they have a lot of unlocked potentials and that they really uh, are one of the biggest contributors to better uh, relationship with the climate. Uh, of course, to ensure healthy food, uh, green energy, and also uh, for many new business opportunities and tourism being just one of them. So when that was launched, I'm glad, glad that the new commission picked it up. So this is this became one of the pillars that is uh, also has a financial support. And uh, we hope that this will bring even higher awareness all over the world on this topic. Um, let me just quickly go to some of the challenges that we uh, identified so far, not only uh, through the political career, but some of these already emerged out of the uh, eco-civilization engagements. We had the great discussions on local communities, global communities, and some of these points are emerging already from there. And uh, let me briefly walk you through them. Uh, the future of ownership will be a big uh, topic, uh, which needs to be addressed on both levels, uh, rural and uh, urban. Uh, especially uh, subject of accountability, stewardship of assets, data, land, raw materials, um, and so on. The next one is the societal focus and priorities regarding the public space. Um, then ethical discourse about humanity, the technology, the planet as a whole. The new geo geopolitics, which are emerging right now. Uh, and of course, they are very much related to the future of countries, nations, cultures, and development of local identities. The concept of public health and education, uh, the question of uh, overall the identity of uh, local communities, um, and the transformative power of localization and global, uh, globalization, working together uh, in some sort of transparent uh, way uh, with the uh, relating well to the laws of nature and developing trust. Um, within eco-civilization, this has been addressed and I'm inviting you, if you are more interested in that, to check it out on the webpage ecocivilization.eu, the discussions on local and global communities. As, as I said, the essence of all this discussion is that in order to move forward and to really build a future that has um, the dignity of humanity at uh, its core. Uh, our invitation is uh, to work on trust, to work on transparency, and to start trusting each other that we can do what it feels right, which means through our in intuitive channels being connected to the global consciousness. And uh, while we are acting in our own um, name and within our own capacities, we're constantly serving also the higher good. So that would be the quick introduction. And uh, now let me go back to our speakers and uh, of course, invite them to share their thoughts. First, I would like to ask Dr. Ashok to share with us his story. Uh, his story is quite an amazing one. He lives, works, and basically live for uh, the rural area, people in the rural area, especially the most vulnerable ones, which are young people, kids, and women. So uh, Dr. Ashok, it's a really great uh, pleasure and uh, a great honor to welcome you in uh, within our session. And the word is yours. Can you all hear me? Yes. All right. So um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Violetta, for uh, inviting me out here to share my thoughts and views with everybody. Um, 
I am a medical physician, a medical doctor, and I work in rural India. Um, and therefore, the presentation that I'm going to make is uh, about smart villages in the context of rural India. Uh, I would like to begin by defining village in the Indian context. Census in India designates places with equal to or less than 5,000 inhabitants as a village. 80% of Indian villages have a population of less than 1,000. The geographical area covered by a gram panchayat or a village council is what we define as a village. Now, uh, I would like to emphasize this because gram panchayat is the local governing body it's 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 the it's it's comprised of people from the village itself, and they're the ones who govern uh, themselves. Uh, our last census was in two thousand and eleven, and as for that census, seventy percent of the population in India lives in villages. So uh, over the last ten years, maybe this seventy percent has reduced to sixty five, but even today, uh, anywhere between 65 to 75, 70 percent of the population in uh, India live in villages. What are the characteristics of our Indian villages? Usually a homogeneous group of people with a strong caste system, with traditional social norms, with a high level of patriarchy, people who are dependent on the agricultural economy, uh, a group of people, a community that suffers from significant levels of poverty and lack of employment opportunities. That is what a typical village uh, of India can be described as. Now, uh, ever since I got this invitation, I've been thinking of what would be the key goal uh, of a village community in order to shift from uh, what it is today to a smart village. And in my perception, it would be uh, the improvement in the human development index. I would use that as the key goal for, for defining a smart village. What would uh, we, we measure in terms of achievement Life expectancy, people having a long and healthy life. Education, people being knowledgeable, right from children, right up to the elderly, um, and families and individuals uh, enjoying a good per capita income for a decent uh, standard of living. So these three, to my mind, would be the definition of, would be the, the objective of um, a smart village. Now, what are the key challenges and opportunities for making a village smart in this country? I will uh, talk about challenges and I will then go on to what kind of opportunities exist in this country in order to overcome those challenges. So the first challenge and perhaps the most important one is poverty, unemployment, uh, the result of what of that, there is a huge migration of people to nearby towns and to cities, uh, urban migration, which has its own, own uh, uh, huge level of problems. I think all of you may have heard of how this massive migration took place during the COVID back from urban areas to rural areas because people lost their jobs. What are the opportunities within villages in order to make them smart? We need to have soil management, watershed and water conservation, access to agricultural resources, which includes electricity, seeds, fertilizers, etc. Above all else, access to markets for selling their produce. A reasonable return for agricultural produce. I don't know how many of you listen to the news, but today the farmers are up in arms asking for a reasonable return uh, for agricultural produce, which they term as minimum support price. For the, those who are landless laborers, 
who are not farmers, an employment guarantee scheme for marginal, particularly for marginal farmers, an agricultural insurance scheme and agro-based and allied industries for those who do not want to shift or migrate to urban areas and want to find uh, entrepreneurship within the rural areas. What are the other challenges that uh, villages suffer from? Uh, it's basically lack of access to resources. So I would start off by lack of basic amenities, portable drinking water, drainage, sanitation, electricity, internet con connectivity. These are some of the key, key uh, uh, things which our villages lack in terms of basic amenities. Lack of educational facilities. Now, most of our villages have schools uh, with six to eight years of schooling. If children want to go for higher education, for higher schooling, up to 12 years of schooling, they need to go to, they have to go to neighboring, uh, neighboring villages or neighboring uh, towns and cities where there are schools uh, for higher education. There is a poor focus on female literacy, something which has been emphasized again and again in this country. And even those who reach 12 years of, or attain 12 years of schooling, there's no linkage with colleges and vocational training centers, something that people are really in need of and are demanding. But there is lack of basic health services. Uh, this became so apparent uh, during the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, there is lack of preventive, promotive, curative services, uh, villages can provide only this, this amount of basic health care, um, and therefore there is need for referral centers, referral services, and a good referral system. There is a lack of referral system as well. Now, the problem, the key problem I would say in this country is we are doing all of this. It's not as though resources are not there and we are not having schemes and programs to address all of these challenges and problems. It's there. The problem is that we work in verticals. We work in silos. In, in India, that perhaps is the biggest problem. There are good legislations, there are policies, programs, all of these work as vertical schemes and in silos. That's the problem. And if we want to create a smart village, connecting the dots, connecting these verticals is absolutely the key. Horizontal uh, integration and providing value addition to what is going on at this point of time, I think is the key to creating a smart village in India. Can this be done? Are there examples of this happening in the country as of today? Yes, there are good examples. In the health sector, there is the National Rural Health Mission. There's the National Child Health Program, uh, where these dots have been, have to some extent, I would say not entirely, but to some extent, these dots have been joined. There is, there is horizontal integration in these programs. In the agricultural sector, you take the examples of Amul, uh, Amul Milk Cooperative, the Venkatesh hatcheries, which is a poultry, poultry uh, 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 a private concern uh, for poultry, and Lijak Puppers, which are which are which is a, a, a condiment. It's 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 it's, it's an eatable, which is created by uh, rural women. In all of these, you see the connecting dots between distribution of raw material right up to marketing, and therefore these. These programs have been extremely successful in this country because we were able to connect the dots. We were able to have horizontal in, uh, uh, integration and value addition. <clears throat> so uh, based on this experience, what the, country, uh, what the government is doing now, the government of India, they're establishing farmer produce organizations and their key role is going to be integration and value chain establishment. So they are not going to be implementers. They are going to only be uh, uh, agencies which coordinate uh, various silos and various schemes and various actors, stakeholders, um, and bring them together 
funnel all the resources uh, effectively for better implementation. Now, is there a role for digital integration? Yes, there is. However, before we even think about it, we need to think about better internet connectivity in villages. It's not there right now. Internet content in the vernacular. So if you, you, know, if you have better internet connectivity, you provide information on the internet, it needs to be in the vernacular, which is relevant to rural audiences, to agricultural uh, communities. Uh, we need to have IT for integration in the field of health, education, and basic amenities. There are so many NGOs in this country who have provided uh, pilot, pilot programs, connecting the dots, creating integration, and, and implementing programs in all these three areas very, very effectively. Can we use social media for marketing of agriculture produce? Again, there are examples where this has been done very successfully. In India, in rural India, there is a particular democratic decision-making body, which is known as the Gram Sabha, where all of the, all the people in a village come together, uh, including youth and women, to take key decisions. It's a very democratic process. And if this integration is done at that level through the Gram Sabha, it would be sustainable and it would be replicable. I would like to really emphasize this point. How can we call a village smart, or for that matter, any community smart, which ignores half its population? And when I say half its population, I'm referring to girls and women. We need to have, we need to, in, in eco-civilization, we need to include a socio-ecological model which emphasizes gender, a gender equitable society. There are enough laws, policies, entitlements for girls and women. I was so confused with the number of, of schemes and the number of entitlements that the, girl, that the government has published on paper. But all of this needs to be effectively implemented and through integration. There is, again, all of these are functioning in silos. We need to build movements that challenge the existing gender norms, build movements that challenge the politics of patriarchy, challenge the norms that discriminate against girls and women. I have to, very shamefully, I have to admit that in this country, the girl gets discriminated against right from the time she's in the womb, right till she is an elderly person. That needs to change if we want to call our villages smart. I would like to really end by saying this. We have a rich Agri and Panchayati Raj heritage and culture. This should continue to be our civilizational identity instead of adopting corporatized industrial models of development that are alien to us for creating smart villages in this country. Thank you all for your patient listening. Microphone, Violetta, Mike. Thank you very much. And uh, this was a really excellent overview of Dr. Ash of what's going on in India. And uh, what is particularly encouraging is uh, that you show so many positive elements that could uh, be additionally empowered in order to work together to bring this uh, concept of a smart village, which is actually the village that works for the benefit of the entire population uh, forward. So uh, I hope you will uh, jump in in the conversation when others are presenting their points of view and start looking for a points of engagement with the rest of the uh, continents uh, and colleagues Excellent. who will present yes. them. But thank you very much for this very thorough uh, review of what's going on in India. So Derek, uh, I would invite you to go next. 
so you come from Ghana, you are representative of a young generation who is engaging uh, also in uh, rural and urban area, trying to find the connection. So please go ahead and mute yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you, Valletta. And uh, I wanna say I'm really, uh, you know, excited to be here and uh, the honor uh, of being uh, among you guys, having the discussions uh, is indeed, you know, outstanding. But I also wanna thank Dr. Ashok for the overview of the, uh, the topic and then the context to which we all are here. So um, I would first like to address the whole conversation right from how villages are perceived in Ghana and, and how you know I personally perceive villages. So in Ghana, villages actually are sort of referred to uh, or described as places of, let's say, destitute, a place of no hope, and then a, a place that uh, there are less people to which there is less infrastructure, there is less uh, intentional designs of social frameworks that makes the inhabitants of this place able to to grow internally and then outwardly. Um, for me personally, my view of how I see villages should be uh, a place where a group uh, of people with a common understanding, uh, you know, drawing several principles to which they agree to evolve on. And then this has to do with, uh, you know, co-creation, building uh, things out of our personal engagements within our peer-to-peer -peer groups, you know, not having one centralized system to reach uh, actions or, you know, directions are being, uh, you know, in improvised. So uh, to me, how my work personally as a data scientist and a researcher, and also currently expanding into urban development contributes to the emergence of smart cities. I have really uh, diverse, let's say, uh, information and knowledge in computer architecture and then the analysis to which I'm able to uh, create systems and then able to find leveraging points between how uh, a system within agriculture system and then a, a system living within the, the realms of uh, technology application could be merged, you know, and find possible uh, solutions to, uh, you know, making the systems uh, evolve. But then uh, I started out with a company that is a startup called uh, Monarch. And Monarch basically is a philosophy that stands on uh, having reverence within nature's own pattern principles because we as humans have always been looking to nature for answers, right? So if we are now able to devise or develop a model based on biomimetics and then leverage that to uh, our systems to which they keep on evolving, but then there is still that hidden pattern that nature always you know, uh, puts there that you could uncover just by creating systems where people are now able to you know, think for themselves, are able to build collective consciousness and also leverage that to developing their own ecosystem that works for them. So yeah, that is how uh, I got to you know, get on this journey and then you know, trying to uh, see how I could be of help to other communities as well. Super, thank you very much, Derek. Uh, just uh, stay with me for a few more seconds. Um, I know that you are especially focusing, as you mentioned as well, on technologies. Where do you see the biggest, uh, I mean, where would you make the first step and how, where do you act actually precisely in order to, uh, to support the, the village uh, lifestyle and uh, create new opportunities and as you say, uh, create systems that are supporting the development of collective consciousness as well. Where do you start? Where have you started? So currently, uh, I founded this uh, startup, right? And then we've been looking how to build a model and a framework, which literally uh, integrates into architecture and design. So it, it literally emulates something we call property technology. Now, uh, property technology, if we are trying to uh, build smart villages. The, the you know, uh, model that is uh, is recognizable there is infrastructure, right? Now, if you put in infrastructure, how does this infrastructure actually 
you know, make the people using them efficient and then productive, then that's where the technologies that are going to be placed into these buildings uh, come into play. So if blockchain security is going to uh, be, you know, used in, let's say, a banking system or banking hall that we're trying to develop for a smart village, what are the possibilities of that block? Uh, we, it seems like we lost the uh... blockchain framework, not okay, becoming biased towards a certain uh, data I get from these villages. I used to. Can, mm. Excuse me, can you hear me? Now it's fine. Okay. Yeah, you would disappear for a few seconds. But tell me, there is so, uh, how 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 are okay, people right. uh, perceptive for something like that? Do you have problems explaining that uh, in uh, so, to villagers? Uh, yeah. How do you do that? And we lost you again. Okay, let's let's get back to the, uh, Derek with his questions later, and uh, uh, let's move on because this was a very interesting point of view, especially of a young entrepreneur startup who is trying to find also the business opportunity uh, in this uh, creating the bridge between rural and uh, also uh, the, improvement in terms of, uh, the urban, you know, Derek, governments. Derek, we, we'll, okay. So um, now let's see what's happening in Latin America. I would uh, first like to invite Delfina uh, to share with us her experience from Argentina. And uh, uh, Derek, if you're with us, uh, just uh, stay with us and we will get back to you uh, after we're done with Latin America. Please, Delfina, go ahead. Thank you, Violeta. Uh, thank you, the, all the panelists. I think it was very comprehensive, especially Ashok's uh, presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm actually now in a, uh, in a coffee shop near the school. I'm in the desert of Atacama and connectivity is quite a challenge. So I think it's one of the aspects of being in a small village. I work, I have two hats. I work for um, a foundation in, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, and we work with schools from the north, uh, northern provinces of, of Argentina, which are schools in very um, low socioeconomic uh, levels and very vulnerable and uh, they are surrounded uh, small villages. So these uh, schools uh, are set all over there. And then now I'm in an um, eco-literacy project here in Antofagasta. Antofagasta is, uh, this is a quite small city, uh, but it's really uh, vibrant and, and quite powerful in the, in the in the overall of Chile, which is it gives me two different perspectives, and and through the questions that you brought, Violeta, I was thinking what I've seen that change. I think the pandemic has changed many aspects of small villages, and I I have one um, I have a few that I want to name. The first one is it has uh, changed value, so the value of being connected to nature has increased immensely and it has increased in the sense we the societies have uh, acknowledged that being in contact with nature is very much what we need especially at this moment where what our well-being is being impacted and i have the opportunity to work with teachers and principals and what i've realized is after the pandemic the mental health of youth and uh and professionals has been really um been one of the most important issues. So there has been a, a, move, a lot of movement of people from the city centers, from the city of Buenos Aires and the city of Santiago coming back to small villages to the north and to the south of, of, of Argentina, uh, of Chile and Argentina. So uh, that was one of the aspects that I want to bring. And also- uh, Delfina, bring that, Delfina yeah. may I just jump in and ask you because um, this is quite an, a big change. So how do you deal mm. with education? Yeah, okay. So one of the, the things that we uh, deal with education is 
We worked, we created uh, with Alexander actually uh, what we call circles of community response and is a way of organizing the, com the educational community in, in a very different way, which means the value it is, uh, it is within us in the way we organize ourselves. And this is quite key important here in, in South America, especially because we are very much used to uh, putting our um, kind of looking for backup from the city centers or from the uh, Europe or the US. And it's not about us and what do we need to do? It's not about being local and that is changing absolutely. So what we do is we come together uh, to resolve a problem in, a, in creative ways with the resources that we have. And that has sparked a different narrative instead of a lacking uh, mindset of the resources that we have, it has shifted towards an abundance and a possibility uh, mindset where resources are within us. And uh, yeah, and it has had an amazing impact. So I wanna, I brought a small, um, I wanna share something Please. that we are doing now uh, within schools and it's a, a small PowerPoint presentation. It's only one slide. I want to bring some elements of how we are interweaving all of these things together uh, within uh, the educational system. So we are giving special focus not only to our thinking and our cognitive capacities, but our feeling, our sensing and our intuition and how all of that gets integrating in our doing. And coming together and rethinking the way that we are doing things and putting value to the things that we have locally here. And I'm gonna bring one of the, ex the most beautiful examples here in, in the north of Chile, in the desert of Atacama. This is one of the driest zones in the world. And water is key to the survival for everyone. So um, we've been talking to uh, native people that are that take care of the water here in a very particular way that is not how uh, the rest of the cities or, and the most important cities uh, work with water. So we are bringing that, that attention towards the whole society and saying, this is a knowledge that we need to bring to the center and uh, really kind of uh, realize that there's different ways of doing this and this is value and it's at the very uh, very much of the periphery of, of the system so um, with that we have reflective practice we are we're big in focusing in how we do things uh, what is the, our practice within the purpose and the action plan that we have developed we have a systemic experience and with that is we we talk about the sensing feeling intuition and doing a uh, in thinking and doing, but we do it not only in an individual, individual level, but into a community level. So we bring our like the consciousness towards ourselves and think, where do we want to go? What are the assets that we have and how we can improve that and offer that value to the whole society, to Antofagasta, for example, or Cujuy in, in Argentina. So we give back through projects that give value to the system, the whole system. So doing that, what I've seen is there's a different way of making meaning of shared experiences. And that adds on new uh, knowledge and, and into the whole system again. And we do that through interdisciplinary projects. So it's sensing and actualizing the emerging future is like, how are things changing today? How can we kind of face that collectively really connecting with uh, the space and, and, and our human capacities and bring something that is quite new, but is quite in, uh, kind of reality-based in, into this moment here. So that's a little bit of what we are doing um, right now. Delfina, uh, so yeah. uh, it feels like a very natural behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, do people respond like that to this approach? I mean, do we need to teach them a lot or is this spontaneous sort of uh, engagement that is happening? Oh, thank you for the beautiful question. Um, both. So what happens is we are behaving in a different way that we are used to. And so that brings a lot of uh, misunderstanding sometimes, but also there is a need of, of 
behaving in this way, being more open, uh, collaborative, and also in sharing in such a way that heals the whole system. Mm. And that's quite uh, interesting because the relationships that come out of this uh, involvement are much more stronger. And then you, what you can see, and it's uh, quite interesting, is then after working uh, for some time on this, it's what it starts to, to happen is that there is self-organization. Groups self-organize in such a way that they kind of face and, and, and approach different challenges that it's not about education only, you know. It's about how people want to face reality right now. And um, which is, I, I would say, counterintuitive in the sense, usually here in s small villages, um, not the smart ones, let's say, they wait for the system to kind of uh, give something, you know, or, or support them in such a way. And what we're doing is we are, shifting completely at the understanding and saying well, we have these needs how are we going to cope with this what do we need and how we can ask uh, others to support us uh, during our journey and um, and I think that's at the core of smart villages it's like ownership of uh, the movement and the transformation and the knowledge that we want to share as a as a local village that really puts us out there and makes us unique. Um, yeah, I hope I was helpful. Oh, fantastic, uh, Delfina, thank you. And uh, please feel free to engage in the conversation with your colleagues after we finish the round, because uh, I hope you already seeing some points of uh, leverage points uh, that uh, are commonly shared among uh, you all. Uh, Derek, you're back. Uh, just a quick comment maybe because uh, Delfina is talking about the system approach as well that you were referring to, but unfortunately we lost you uh, while you were explaining uh, how you address, how you get uh, local people on board. But uh, please uh, come in. Thank you. Thank you, Valeta. So uh, I think it will be really helpful if I could maybe share a presentation with you guys please, in regards to, in, yeah, in regards to the work that we are also doing at Mona City. So our project is um, in relation to a smart city, but then the smart city being developed from the foundations of uh, quantifying the whole process into a pilot. That is, if you're developing for um, 27,000 hectares, you need to size that. Uh, that development into, let's say, a more modular framework that is at least maybe about 15,000 square meters and then creates that system of decision making, you know, uh, infrastructure, you know, the social system, see how the people interact, you know, within that same region before you are able to, let's say, conclude on going further. So at Mona City, the whole, uh, you know, process works in terms of architecture and design. And uh, our whole idea is building you know, the next frontier for modern construction or the construction of civilizations. And you know, the slogan uh, you know, in, in doctrine built by you literally refers to uh, you, the person coming to live within this city as part of the co-creating process because within these first phases, our whole intention is to open up a really collaborative platform for you know, people who might be uh, potential citizens of this a city to start engaging and you know uh, putting down the, the the foundational structures to which uh, you know the whole emergence of the city comes through. And the group that is involved by working this comes in uh, the form of let's say a diverse you know uh, kind of people, and it includes scientists, visionaries, architects, and all sort of people. Right? We 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 open the room up for a lot of creativity to be able to actually build this framework for planetary system that, that is literally having uh, integration into every system that is possibly thinkable. And not just building the systems, but then taking reverence on the patterns that nature already has, you know, in existence. And the problem that we are actually identifying that is the problem, uh, is the core problem that is, you know, stifling innovations of, uh, let's say, cities, to, to become smart or villages to become smart is creativity, right? There's the need for more creative hubs that are open, spatial, you know, could be designed online and inline, 
and as well as offline for community engagement. And these spaces could have their foundations built on augmented reality technologies, mixed reality, and all these uh, you know, technologies that makes interaction more you know, feasible and simulated. There's a need for you know, uh, peer to peer internet, uh, a more decentralized internet that has its core foundations on data privacy, right? Data security, digital asset control, 3D to 4D web interactions. Also, there's a need for a distributed energy system. That is each and every person having the ability to produce for themselves you know, energy that is sovereign to them and not being able to depend on any system that you know, could cause them to become less efficient and then less productive because these things are not there. So in designing for uh, this particular uh, framework that we're talking about and then having your foundations within mixed reality, it is really difficult if you know, pipelines aren't, aren't followed. And what do I mean by pipeline? The design process of uh, construction to uh, the technology design down to social design needs to be re, uh, you know, carefully curated. That is the, 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 the first thing is comes first, right? So that you're able to uh, know the constraints and then the problems that are uh, quickly emergent. You also need to identify getting content, you know, that could be I created through multiple channels and then uh, available for the people who are part of this uh, creating process, especially if they are all distributed in different places around the world. The third will be in terms of mixed reality collaboration or using this technology in terms of collaboration. There's not every single person that has uh, the finances to be able to uh, purchase headsets that you know, get them to become creative within this process. So um, these things need be, needs to be carefully you know, identified. Now, if they are identified, the solutions that are possible you know, to emerge will be eco over green buildings that are made from sustainable wood and you know, low carbon concrete infrastructures that are made from renewable materials. There will be inherent hubs that are developed that are light industrial buildings that are designed and powered with smart technologies. So when you're talking about smart villages and smart cities, there needs to be sort of like uh, an industrial network structure, right? That creates the, the system of uh, you know, innovation, manufacturing and all those things to which the, the primary uh, you know, invention hubs could be built in the villages that is responsible for, you know, creating the raw produce. And then those channels with integrated mobility could be sent down to the, you know, the cities or the, the bigger industrial places to be now, you know, converted into secondary products. And mm -hmm. all these systems makes, uh, you know, the whole process less, uh, you know, carbon, uh, how do I say it? it? It gives the whole process a more, um, advantage of our you know, carbon emission. Then mm -hmm. the test solution will be a mixed reality pipeline that is literally having a decentralized internet, which is developed on blockchain, uh, you know, uh, aesthetics. It is artificial intelligence agnostics. But then I would really I love to explain how artificial intelligence built for a localized community could function without having you know, all the biases included. Mm -hmm. Then the last one will be power plants, you know, that are uh, smart renewable systems, which could be solar, wind, or hydro, you know, or even thermal plants, but then they are monitored on smart technology to be able to distribute the energy to the places that they are needed. Right now, I could, you know, literally attest to the fact that there are countries that are there, that the taxpayer's money is being used to, you know, build these systems of energy, but then the taxpayer is not getting enough of that energy. The energies are being mm -hmm. sold under, you know, heating contracts and things like that. Super. There do I understand that this is sort of a model to build something from scratch, which could uh, also be used uh, as a structure for smart villages uh, that uh, just are entering the process of restructuring. Okay. Uh, it seems like we lost him again. So, uh, Natasha, can I ask you to stop the presentation? And I would like to give a word to Alexander, who wants to uh, come in before we continue with our speakers. Alexander, please go ahead. Thank you. And just very briefly, because I don't want to interrupt the flow. This is very rich and very um, 
uh, very complementary what we're hearing so far and just a reflection that so far was coming out. One of the things you asked uh, while Delfina was presenting, for example, is the participation. Is this natural? Does, do people feel, I think something we can keep in mind as we continue to listen, do people feel this is strange uh, being participating or and being involved in, in, in a smart, uh, smart, smart village engagement? How, how is that? We can continue to ask ourselves this question as we listen. I think what we're hearing now from Derek, what we heard from, from uh, all, all the presenters thus far, Dr. Ashok and Delfina as well, is that this empowerment is really at the core and it's partly remembering our own collective intelligence, remembering that none of us is as smart as all of us. And that even the self-reliance in villages, like what Delfina was talking about, and what Derek has just been describing, can augment the self-reliance of the villages. And this turns into what Dr. Ashok was also talking about so powerfully into these smart, uh, smart villages. So just to keep in mind that uh, this is actually the natural state where we are interdependent. And we have forgotten a lot because of the separation that is imposed by the structures of society that say we have to depend on higher power coming from the cities, coming from the government. But self-reliance, returning, bi biomimicry helps a lot with that, what Derek was talking about. Learning this interdependence, I think that's really key. So let's continue to listen to the presentations and keep an ear out for this interbeing and this interdependence. Great, thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, note that we can even broaden our uh, perceptions and even uh, go deeper in understanding what is shared here. So thank you very much for that, Alexander. And now let's move on to Sophia. Uh, Sophia, you have a great story to share as well, your personal story. Uh, you're coming from Brazil and uh, well, all years, please come in. Hello, people. I'm very glad to be here and I'm feeling a little nervous, so I'm sorry if I mistake a little bit with the words. Um, I really like to listen to what the other colleagues shared. And um, so I'm a person who comes from the city, but I've chosen to go to move into the farm. And part of my decision also comes from the fact that I was able to, I was privileged enough to live for two years and study in, in a school in rural India. So uh, Dr. Ashok's um, contributions uh, brought me many nostalgia and, and how, um, and, and what, one understanding that for me is a very important understanding, which is um, both people and the environment we are inserted in uh, shapes a lot of, of our cognition, our the way we, we perceive reality and the way we build our understanding of what development, for instance, is. So for me to have the opportunity to study in rural India was something that definitely has a big, a big role in my, in my, let's say, my destiny. And also in my childhood with my grandmother who came from the field. So she herself had a strong relation to, to farming. Um, and then, so now here I am, I moved out from the city and moved into a farm. And me and my family, we, we produce organic food. And to be able to be here today in this meeting, I had to come down to the city to family places so I get to have the connectivity and and hold on the internet so so I can be here and that that's a very uh, let's say um, marking point in 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 rural village living in Brazil um, and one thing so so one of a few of the questions that Violeta shared with us for us to engage in the conversation um, going into how are villages perceived in your country? For that, I, I, I will bring a few aspects. So we still have a cultural understanding um, that comes from a concrete idea, as not a concrete idea, but a concrete reality, um, which is the weight of the pen is lighter than the weight of the hole. So this is an understanding that, you know, all of our grandparents who came 
from from the rural villages and went into the rural exodus into the cities um, uh, really thinking about um, how life in the in the farms are uh, lack much more much of the quality that is really possible for one to grasp for and that's not what you want for your children so you know uh, brazilian culture is very embedded with this idea that um the rural area is not uh a good place to to live in and to create uh your family and 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 you know the succession of the generations so that's very sad. That's that's deeply, deeply very sad. And that and it has some very specific roots also. And one of the roots that I will point out is how um, unequal the distribution and the access to land in Brazil really is. Brazil is one of the countries that holds one of the greatest rates of inequality to access to land. So one like a few brief data is. Um, half of the of the farming land is owned by only one percent of the population and um small stakeholders who own land that go up until 10 hectares of area they occupy only some 2.3 percent of all the farming area and at the same time it is uh, the majority of the food that supplies the whole country comes from from mostly the small stakeholders land so it's really it's a very you know brutal reality where you have very few people in a big country owning very large areas and producing um, commodities that don't even, um, that very scarcely, and you know, there's a big discussion, uh, there's a big internal discussion for us here to dwell upon how, um, how this whole um, structure that makes Brazilian economy mostly focused on the production of commodities, how little does it really uh, gives feedback for the country, for our nation, you know? So this is a major discussion in Brazil. So this is the unfortunate reality that we have. Um, um, you have much land uh, in, the, in the hands of, of very few families. And, um, and at the same time, uh, you have this sort of identity crisis uh, where we uh, where it is said that we have only 15 percent of the population lives in the rural area but this data is very questionable as well because um, there are a few political tendencies that make it interesting for a district to consider itself as an urban district uh, like some like texas uh, taxes that are collected uh, internally in, this, in the district. When it's an urban in district, uh, the taxes are higher and things like that. So, so uh, even this data of how rural Brazil really is, is very questionable because you see uh, very small towns, villages kind of, um, where the main activities are related to farming and where sanitary uh, conditions are not at all, let's say in the urban patterns, and they're con they're considered uh, rural. They're considered urban, you know. So this this data for me comes along with the major idea where um, why um, when has it become reasonable for us to understand that a developed nation needs to um, uh, disconnect itself to the rural identity and to the rural potentials and, and focus on the rural limitations as well. Um, so these are a few of the, of the things that I wanted to point out about Brazil uh, in, this, in this perspective. And then I will try to be uh, a little brief with what I wanted to share as well, which is, uh, so I, I, I believe that the idea of a village comes together of the idea of a community which is bounded by uh, shared geographical, um, economical, and a cultural reality. So people 
living in a specific territory and um, and when you live in a specific territory, uh, you're dealing with the same ecosystems uh, resources which are available and the and also the ones that aren't available. So if you're living in a place where you have uh, abundancy of water, then that's something that the, the community will commonly share, even if it goes in an unequal uh, way of this sharing, you're dealing with some sort of same reality. So in a way, I, I, I wanted to say that I, my understanding of a village comes in this, in this sort of a common shared reality. And then, um, and, but the, uh, so to understand villages, I think it's also interesting for us to remember that a village implies on the idea of human settlements. And even though this is what we mostly see today, it's not the only way human species has organized itself along our history. Actually, for most of our human history, we weren't really settled in places. We were mostly nomad populations, which um, uh, moved from places to the other according to the seasons, according to food availability and resources availability. I, I personally really find interesting to dig in this past to understand how what we conceive as, as so obvious and so uh, given, like the the towns and the cities and villages and stuff like that, uh, is really part of a very small part of human history. No, and that to me is really interesting because uh, you know there is a bunch a very um, important discussion, I think, on how on how the moment we as a species started to work, to, to learn how to cultivate food and then to make agriculture, to make farming uh, the hegemonic way for us to supply our necessities, how this was, you know, perhaps the most important turning point in our history. And um uh and so um so in in other words it was the birth of agriculture that promoted the first human settlements and as a birth is there was a whole process of gestation for people to finally learn how to cultivate seeds how to make food so just on just a specific note on to this because i find it interesting uh, for other reflections, maybe not too directly in what we are going to now, but just a brief note. So there are some archeological and anthropological findings that suggest that the sexual division of labor where in the nomad peri period, where men were often out of the camping sites for some days to hunt the meat and women were on the camping sites together with the elders and the children, they were the, the biggest responsible to providing the food of the day-to-day -day life. And with that, they were more uh, responsible to go um, looking for roots, looking for herbs, looking for fruits. And, and, and this experience of these, let's say, um, um, this more substantial activity of going and, and looking for which, which uh, edible roots are there and, and understanding the plants and understanding the ecosystem and understanding like some very, let's say, some, some things that technically evolved to the understanding of how to cultivate land, which is when you, when you, dig, um, when you dig the land, the soil in searching for roots and you find that in a more, uh, structured soil, the roots are bigger, uh, are better to be harvested, then you start really um, absorbing the, the first knowledges, the primitive knowledges that further on led to women perceiving that the seed that they harvest from the fruit that they collected uh, after they, they cooked and, and some of it was uh, put aside they started to germinate. So this whole profound observation of how nature works and how nature reproduces itself uh, was really like the groundings of the movement towards settling humanity, towards making it able to produce food um, uh, that you wouldn't need to be going from one place to the other 
if you had enough to accumulate and hold on for, for let's say, a dry season. So um, uh, I find this these thoughts interesting. And, um, um, and then at some point, obviously, each part of the globe uh, had its moments. But it's interesting to see how history shows that it was a, a hegemonic choice for humans to settle and to to really uh, build these civ the civilizations the the settlements uh, um, uh, sustaining itself in in the farming fields sustaining itself in the production of food uh, through the cultivation so I wanted to sort of bring this to think that um, I, I don't I think that there is no way um, to think of the existence of villages without regarding the food supply systems that sustain it. And today uh, in my country, the, flu the food supply system is not a smart one. Um, uh, so why is it not a smart one? Because uh, I think, and then I think we go a little into the concept of what smart is. Um, I think for something to be considered smart for us to think of this uh, conception, we need to connect with the idea of wisdom, with intelligence, and and to connect with this with the idea of real intelligence and and you know wise choice making uh, regarding us at, as a species that has you know a bunch of functions and that are uh, that are, that need to deal with the, what the ecosystem is there for us. Um, we need to to connect. We need to be able to make to manage our living activities, uh, to make them thrive while we meet our necessities and we make life on the planet better. It sounds something maybe too distant if if you're not um, very familiar with these discussions or even familiar with um, with uh, farming and so, but. In very simple terms, if we are making farming uh, an activity that has been damaging the very basic resources we need to sustain our villages, to sustain then the cities as well, then we're not making clever decisions. We're not making an intelligent process. And um, my point and what I try to contribute in our discussion and uh, you know, wherever I'm inserted in, is how um, we really need to focus on efficient agricultural methods that can be integrated with what life itself operates to generate uh, uh, abundance. And that really means um, making agricultural um, methods and techniques that are capable of increasing photosynthesis rates and increasing the biomass dynamics in the soil. So that means in, my, in what we have in our um, place, which is near very, we, we live far, 40, 40 kilometers from Brasilia, which is the capital. Uh, what we have uh, managed to, to present as, you know, um, you know, our experiment of solution for this big problem, which is the management of the ecosystems in order to attend humanity necessities and produce abundance. Uh, we have come to, to creating systems where we cultivate multiple uh, um, plants together um, with, with, with a very specific methodology. It's not like, oh, okay, let's plant many things together no we, we have some some uh, some few years of, of, of trial and failure and understanding the the behavior of each plant and things like that and so we make consortia consortiums of, of, of plants that thrive together and uh, alongside the the plants that are economically important for our activity we are always planting the the plants that need to be there in order to fulfill uh, an ecosystem service that is demanded. So we plant many trees, many, many other kind of, let's say bushes and, and herbs that are actually going to be uh, very constantly pruned so that they are bringing down organic matter to the soil and becoming 
uh, manure and um, and improving life in the soil, which is really our focus with the farming techniques that we use. So, uh, so I, I think my point of view to this discussion is kind of um, that we we don't we have no longer time to be focusing, uh, or rather, not to focus on how can we make life on planet better. Uh, and associate that with our activities. Obviously, we, uh, uh, we're not gonna make that just through poetry, let's say. Poetry is an absolute necessity as well, but uh, it's, not, it's not what's going to convert uh, food and timber production into forests, for instance. So we need to be very um, devoted to finding techniques and efficiencies, uh, and they won't come um, just uh, just um, out of the blue as well. The whole social and the cultural process behind them is also very important for us to, to really go further on. So um, our small proposal, uh, we only managed uh, some four hectares of land. Uh, we're really small, but what we really do is uh, in these four hectares of land, you, we, you have uh, an increasing um, uh, growing of a young forest in a place that were previously only, you know, um, grass um, because too much fire uh, coming through and before that the cattle. So it was a very degraded land and we have now a young forest that grows very slowly because here's a very dry place, which means that the, with not too much water along the year, the, the, the rhythm of the growing of the plants is, is, is slower than let's say in, in the Amazons and, 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 and such. Uh, but then, so we have this uh, practical uh, experiment uh, in place and we, we have been focusing on, on reaching out to people in, in the cities and to people around us, to farmers around us. So we've, we've engaged in a few projects and we've engaged in the local public uh, company for rural assistancy. Um, always thinking that for a smart village to be possible, uh, oh, just, just for me to make a, a statement as well, I had never listened to this, the concept of smart village. So I'm, I've been studying since, since Violeta's proposal for this talk. So, uh, so I'm talking about of what I've understood of the theme and, and now with these these discussions. It, oh, yeah, it give us your easy. view. That's what we're after, Sophia. <laughs> Just feel free to create your own please. definition, please. <laughs> so thinking about this, this concept, which seems a very interesting concept, I cannot but also think about our children. Um, you know, I have a teenager at home, uh, a pre-teenager and a baby. And, and I see how, you know, how enchanted me, my partner uh, and our friends, uh, farmers, we are all very engaged and passionate about uh, the planting and manage, managing of forests al uh, aligned with the food production. But our children, they, they need far more than that. They need to have uh, sports um, activities around. They need to have, you know, um, interesting activities that uh, we as young people in the cities grasp. So I, for me, since I've become um, a stepmother and a, a mother, I, this, this topic of how can you make entertainment life in, in, the, in the field possible has become something really important for me to understand how my own children will want to to be in our land further on, or or they will decide to move out as well, you know. So, so, so yes, yeah, so I, I believe that for villages to thrive, there must be a strong farming culture established, and this strong farming culture needs in this world with climate changes um, and all sorts of of desert for and, and, and big problems with ecosystems management. Mm. So, so for the farming culture to be, um, to be strong and smart, 
it does need to have a good effective technique to deal with the local resources available and create abundance from then on. Um, and for this to be possible, we need to be working wisely with the right plants, considering the, the, the social and the economical uh, context of the place we're working in. And, um, and for that to be possible, we need to be thinking of the succession of the generations in mm -hmm. the field. And that comes in with uh, promoting activities that are important for the development of young people and that make, the, make it interesting for them to, to be there and, you know, and, and, make, and make rural villages thrive mm -hmm. in the future. I, I think this thank is you. it. <laughs> thank you, Sophia, for this very thorough overview and also giving us a much broader perspective of how and why villages was were formed and uh, how we as uh, you know species behaved before. This nomadic uh, memory in our genes is still alive, and uh, you know, and we need to honor uh, everything that is in order to actually capture and move on uh, towards a tribal planet altogether. Thank you very much. It was really thorough. I have a quick question before I move to our last speaker, uh, which uh, comes from Ranji. And I think uh, it's good just uh, to, to say it to you. She, she says in Brazil, um, do you find more number of women in agriculture activities than men? As in India, we see in India women equally engaged in farming along with domestic responsibilities. So how, how does that look like in Brazil? Unfortunately, no. Um, as in, uh, we still have a very deep culture where there is, the sexual division really puts women much more um, um, on their domestic fields and, um, and caring for uh, the, the, the realm, uh, how do you say this in English? Uh, so they are involved in in farming. Um, but do they activity. own the land? No, no. Mm. Statistically, still okay. statistically, the majority of the of the of the land is owned by men. And this is interesting because a very important uh, agrarian reform movement in Brazil called the MST uh, was. Uh, from the 90s on, they started to to make it so that women were. Um, uh, they started promoting this discussion on how land could not go from the disappropriated big farms directly to the men. They started creating this discussion in the agrarian reform movement, and this has evolved, but still, it's it's insufficient. Mm. Thank you very much, and. Uh... We got to the last speaker, Lambert. Uh, the word is yours. I intentionally left you uh, to to come last, uh, especially because uh, you know you do have a different background. You saw uh, already this uh, structural approach and even political and uh, regulatory approach uh, to be implemented partially. Uh, to address some of the challenges that our colleagues are talking. But what's your take on it? And where do you see Europe in uh, relationship with the countryside and smart villages? Thank you very much, Violeta. Of, of course, I want to join first to say that I learned a lot of the very comprehensive presentations from different parts of the world. Uh, maybe I can uh, contribute uh, more to the movement of the villages, the movement of people in the villages connecting worldwide different parts of our, our globe and uh, then maybe give some information about how we organize these things in, in Europe. When I listened to Sophia, I thought we need we need so many more of these authentic people who contribute, and there are so many. It's not that we start from scratch. To give you the, the situation in Europe, Europe is not is one, one part of um, as a continent, but with our 27 member states and with the policies developed in member states, there are many, so many differences. So it's more talking about diversity, about different situations where you see a deep population because people go to more developed parts of Europe, for instance, in Romania, Bulgaria, etc. 
and other parts of Europe who are really booming, who are urbanizing very fast. And in our treaty of the European Union, we have put not as a project, but as a goal to have a cohesive Europe, not to accept that some parts uh, flourish and others go down. And this is important to see where your smart villages or urban, uh, sorry, rural policy might be placed or in a structural way. So it's not good to, to jump into smart villages for three years and then to say, okay, and now we take another policy. This should be something deeper in our way of cooperation. In Europe, it's, it's typically that agricultural uh, policies has been transferred to the European level. Our policies are European-wide, and uh, we can say even more now about the greener Europe, about all the things in the energy transition, of course, also. But agricultural policies has been done by Europe. And so funds go now to the member states. And in the member states, they can transfer till 30% of this money to uh, initiatives to diversify the rural areas, to get communities uh, support, to get more new initiatives in uh, market from going from production to market in a regional uh, way. So we don't start from scratch, but what is important that we bring together um, people who are really working on the rural area, we do it for instance, and I could participate last uh, month in a rural parliaments. We have now 15 of our member states who have rural parliaments where normal people meet, like Sofia, you know, for Brazil, but then for the different countries. And there are competitions in member states organized by rural communities about smart villages. And what is more important, not to be the smartest of the smartest of the smartest with a blueprint, but to go the path to learn and to empower people who are experiencing with energy transition, with those uh, things like uh, the connectivity. And it was especially what I liked so much about Delfina's presentation. It started from the empowerment of people. We cannot say that there is one model complex with, with augmented reality and with all those kinds of things. We cannot reach the people there. We need to empower people into this development. And what I wanted to say in the end is, I work together from cohesion policy with the OECD. The OECD has presented such a good analysis such a good studies uh, for Latin America, for, um, for Asia, for India, in which we can really uh, jump in to get a better understanding and to see structural developments, the facts and figures behind and to learn about this. Um, so it helps us and Europe wants to contribute via, it was called the International Urban Cooperation, uh, especially driven by the cities in the last uh, years, that we get now a kind of smart villages, a more rural movement. And it is what uh, Violeta already said in the beginning. We have now started a European-wide uh, forum for smart villages just this year. And we will use the European funds and also the experiences in international cooperation to give our movement of these smart villages a push in a good direction. So it's not typically that I can bring you more experience from, um, from my own uh, country or my own village, but more how we can empower and bring us to a next stage uh, in, in the global uh, cooperation. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Lambert, for this overview. And also, uh, just maybe a, we can extend an invitation that uh, one of the goals of the forum is to really engage with other continents and uh, kind of start a global rural 
uh, area movement. So um, we are happy to engage with people who wants to uh, yeah. make further steps. Uh, thank you very much for that. And Alexander, I know you, your mind has already started to create some sort of the emergence of new use. So we're all ears. Uh, please uh, share some of your thoughts, um, some of your uh, revelations for today's uh, meeting, because it's uh, we all kind of acknowledge that uh, the words moved us and uh, showed some additional um, sort of insights in what the rural areas are all about. Thank you so much, Violeta. And just quickly, let me know how much time do I have? Because 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. All right. Boink. There we are. OK. Um, how rich this conversation. And I would like to suggest also that, indeed, we are being a village right now. It's a very transient one. It is not a village that is place-based. And yet, there is a sense of identity even here among us, I think, among those who are participating in this. There's a sense of common unity or community. And that's very powerful. So then the question building on, I think, what I got particularly from Sophia's presentation is how do we be that change? How can we be this not just independently, but together? Uh, these are the things Lambert was just mentioning as well. And frankly, all of the speakers have been talking about this uh, way of, this is not just about talking, identifying, but it is about how can we connect? Now, there are many ways of connecting. This is what Dr. Ashok began with, connecting the dots, right? And some of the connecting the dots are place-based. Uh, traditionally, we talk about three types of community. Let me see if I remember. There's a community of place, there's a community of practice, and there's a community of interest. Those are the traditional forms that we talk about. And the idea is, how do these overlap? Often, the definitions, and let me just share with you some of what I got from this presentation here. I was trying to keep track of the different definitions of community, uh, of, sorry, of, of village that came up, of a smart village in particular, but of villages in general. And um, so there are several definitions. One is geographic area, a village, is a geographic area. This is the village, it's here, okay? Another definition comes from population size. A village can't exceed a certain number of people, otherwise it becomes a city. <laughs> so that's another definition of village, but you will see this is pretty abstract. Um, we also have a village as economic and cultural identity. Sophie was talking about shared realities, right? And this, this is an other way of thinking of village. So I want to just share a few things that are coming out of this and to connect them with the broader conversation that we're having. And that is about a global eco-civilization. So this conversation we're having about smart villages takes place within the context of how do we cultivate the conditions? How do we engage in emerging the dynamics that might lead towards a global eco-civilization. What role do smart villages play in the emergence of a global eco-civilization? And a couple of things that, that I've heard in, this, uh, in the presentations, which again, are just amazing. And frankly, let me put another parenthesis in here just to mention that the power of these conversations derives tremendously from the fact that people are walking their talk here. They're not just talking about it. Violetta is, you're leading by example, because we are people from all around the world and the majority of presenters are women. This is incredibly important because this helps shift the narrative and it helps address several of the tremendous blockages that come from with the problems of patriarchy. Um, so just as a synthesis here, some of the things that I'm seeing the importance of education, the importance of learning environments, and the village as a place where you can learn about life. You learn about the importance of interconnection. You learn about your connection with nature. 
you learn about the importance of heritage and of passing down knowledge from one generation to the next. In a village, you have up to seven generations living at the same time. This is also the famous seven generation rule. You have maybe the great grandparents living at the same time as the great grandchildren in a village. How do you make decisions that favor all the members of the village from the great grandparents who are living there to their great grandchildren who are also living at that time? That's the seven generation spread. So you learn about these interconnections. And again, this comes back to what Dr. Ashok was mentioning about the um, connecting the dots. So we connect to nature. We connect to different generations, not just to future generations, but also to our ancestors, learning our ways of being. Another thing that Sophia made us quite aware of is that uh, the patterns of living in settlements in rural and urban conditions is a relatively new thing in the history of our species, right? So learning how to reconnect uh, and reconnect uh, with each other, with nature, uh, with ancestors and with future generations, I think is a key aspect of what the immersive environments of villages may provide. Do remember though, that we are a village, as I mentioned here, a virtual village here, right now, a, a transient virtual village, but it is up to us then to be able to see how do we stay connected? How do we keep this sense of villageness alive? There is no requirement, but I think already there is a sense of interdependence among us uh, in this conversation. So the question is, how do we continue to learn and be with each other? Um, a few more things that came up for me. Um, some of the issues that came up, female literacy, and again, the challenge of the norms of patriarchy. Uh, basic health services, these are barriers. How can we address them in healthy ways? Uh, internet connectivity, and particularly in ways that are accessible to people. So people don't have to come down. Sophia had to come down from, I don't, I don't know why I'm thinking down, but anyway, she had to go from the rural area to the urban area to, uh, to connect, right? Uh, so these are the kind of things that there are solutions. I was reading about somebody who was developing in the Andes, what they call the, um, the donkey net, not the internet, but the donkey net. What did they do? They carried computers with satellite connectivity from village to village where the villages were cut off from the internet, but they brought the computers on the backs of the donkeys to rural areas. And that provided them the opportunity to connect and then they would go on to another place. So once a month, they would have connectivity. Things like that are brilliant, brilliant. They bring people together and uh, allow for uh, us to transcend either with, even with low tech approaches like donkey nets <laughs> to connect people and connect the dots. Um, Another, uh, a couple of other things that I saw here in terms of the problems, a couple more minutes I have. Um, so working in silos, and this is something that Dr. Ashok mentioned right at the beginning, working in silos and the vertical schemes, this comes very much again from a patriarchal framework. We gotta wait for the government to tell us what to do. We gotta wait for the men to tell us what to do. We gotta wait for the cities to give us the support etc. How do we build local self-reliance? And I think what Lambert was just saying at the end through policy, this is very important. How can we create these policies? And a lot of the policies so promisingly come from these rural parliaments. UNESCO has a huge project now on learning cities, but they are really bringing in local self-reliance. Delfina made a huge emphasis on this about the community response circles and how we can develop this type of self-reliance. So, and, and Derek's mentioning about how do we bring in their self-reliance in a ways that bring in the, the, 
the um, reverence, I have a hard time with that word, relevance and reverence, <laughs> reverence for how nature works, how nature, knowing that we are not separate from, and we are not masters of, but we are part of nature. And again, Sophia emphasized this, that this is not something new, but it is something that we have forgotten. We have new approaches through biomimicry, but they are traditional approaches of agriculture and of uh, farming and of food production that help us connect with the land and really truly with each other. So this brings in this idea of remembering, bringing our membership back in. And it's not just a membership with other human beings. It's a membership fundamentally with life. I think the eco-civilization concept is emphasizing this aspect of our membership in the web of life and how the eco-civilization, a global eco-civilization is about reconnecting with that web of life, remembering, bringing our membership back into this conversation with nature, conversation with each other and the interdependence of that, not the domination of it, not the patriarchal sense that we are masters of nature, but that we are part of a larger narrative that is weaving us into existence. I'm getting very poetic, but um, there are several wonderful movements that are emerging from this. There's rewilding, where we are learning to even bring rewilding approaches into cities and into, but we learn about rewilding from the rural areas. How do we learn how to live in harmony with the wilderness of nature, right? Um, there, and Derek was talking about the power of artificial reality and virtual reality environments in terms of the architecture and design process where you are the creator of your environments, but co-creator, not the dominant creator, but you're learning with and from nature in your creative engagements. So, the last thing I think I want to mention here is something UNESCO is also working on, the movement to engage in lifelong learning, again, but also life-wide learning. Life-wide learning is about being in your immersive environment. And there are rich environments, the richest environments for learning are the ones found in villages, not the ones found in cities. In cities, you have pretty much of a monolithic approach to life. You have the buildings and you have designed, human designed world, which can be very rich. You have museums and many other things, but truly the abundance of nature provides us with the richest life-wide learning opportunities. So, and, and this question of how to engage in full spectrum humaning. So we human well together. And that I think is about, again, coming back to connecting the dots, that's about connective intelligence. The beginning is connective intelligence, learning that we're all interconnected, interdependent. So that's connective intelligence, learning how do we connect with nature and with each other. This leads to collective intelligence. So first connective intelligence, then collective intelligence, but even collective intelligence is not the objective. The objective is collective creativity along the lines that Derek was talking about. And that's a wonderful approach that he has and, and opportunities with this uh, monarch uh, approach that he shared, uh, bringing in technology as well when possible. And this can lead to collective wisdom. And Sophia was emphasizing this as well, that it's about not just being collective intelligence or being a smart uh, village, but being a wise village. Connective uh, wisdom can bring to collective wisdom when we learn how to co-evolve with each other. This is the essence of interbeing. Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, and more recently, uh, Charles Eisenstein had been talking about interbeing. This is not the selfish, strident individualism, the sense of self-righteous independence, the siloed approach, but this is the interdependence, not the codependence, but not the independence either where we're separate from each other recognizing the vibrancy of our interdependent world, which is what we're doing right here. So I would like to encourage us again, as I pass it back to Violetta, to think about in, as we are co-creating the conditions for the emergence of a global eco-civilization right now to this notion of smart villages, 
how can we continue to be interdependently connected? How can we continue to thrive together? So when you leave this conversation, don't go away, continue to connect. You have the eco-civilization website. You have ways of continuing to stay in the conversation. This is how we create the world we want to live in. Again, it's about being the systems you want to see in the world. How can we be these systems, these living systems that we want to see in the world? Thank you so much. Wow, excellent. As always, Alexander, thank you. I mean, I've been trying to capture most of your summaries, but of course, I'd be very happy if you just glance through and what uh, add those that uh, I missed, because uh, the, the richness of your statements and words was uh, really the one not to be uh, forgotten. And uh, we will continue to nurture also the new language that we need to develop in order to uh, honor this emergence and this interbeing and of course uh, to get the courage to dream together to dream together means to create together uh, and uh, still uh, be very strong in bringing the individual strengths forward and not uh, for the sake of competition but for the sake of contribution uh, and uh, if nothing else i think today uh, we were all even more encouraged um, to really nurture the rural areas, to nurture the community uh, lifestyle, to nurture the benefits, essence, and incredible richness that uh, uh, it, this identity that exists in rural areas uh, continues to be encouraged to develop and uh, to really help us to create this balanced society, which eco-civilization somehow it's called for to uh, collectively uh, define and collectively support its emergence. So um, at this point, uh, I'd like to hear some reflections from you. And uh, I see Barry uh, with us. Barry, would you like to come in? You, you've been working in a rural areas for a long time. And uh, I would love to hear your comments as well. Hi, Violeta. Barry is uh, calling in from South Africa. Barry, Barry come on, uh, go on. Hi, Violeta, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Great, it, it, it was a very interesting discussion. So, um, Listen to Sophia's um, talk about her farming operation in Brazil. We, we deal with exactly the same issues you're dealing with here in South Africa. The, the, um, the land ownership issues, same thing, 1% controls everything, no access to land. Um, so I can really feel into what, you, what you're speaking about. And, um, I've really enjoyed the discussion today. It's um, I'm just making some notes. I wasn't prepared. I was just came to listen today. So um, the the whole thing about villages, you know, we creatures of place. A, a lot of us, we we it, it it gives us this environment to learn. As a, Alexander, it, it was a perfect. Um, summary of what you heard of the discussion. I really enjoyed listening to that summary. Um, you know, and as human beings, just talking to the access of land and that, you know, there's three things we, we really need. We need clean air, clean water, and just an access to land and simple accommodation so that we can get on and build our communities and create a better world to exist in, you know, when we look at at smart villages, you know, we must. Um, you know, as humans in the cities and and developments, we've created very complicated worlds, very complicated systems. But when we look to nature, nature is just complex. It's a web of complexities that weave with each other, and the closer we 
we, we stay to that. It, it's our learning ground. I, my background is permaculture. And our view on it is to, even from a farming perspective, use as little land as possible and allow nature to take what it needs to look after itself, you know, be part of that system. And from that we learn. So, so for me to hear, yes, we can learn from village environments. We can learn the closeness of nature. It's, it's such an important part to our whole being on this earth. It's, it's kind of, it's creating an alternative nat uh, nation to existing. That's not the one that we're in right now. Because yeah, you know, I work very closely to the damage of land and the damage of agriculture and land rehabilitation. And we 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 really have to unite around something to build these new communities that we that we want for ourselves and for you know again into the next seven generation. Our decisions must be for the next seven generations to come. You, you know, so that so the, the people who are not here, we learn from our ancestors. And for the people who are not here yet, we've got to make decisions for them that are wise right now. So Thank it's you. very exciting. Sorry, I didn't prepare anything else, but I, I really enjoyed listening to the... Thank you very much, Barry, also for your summary and this uh, very important uh, point that you made uh, about complexity and complication in the cities and complexity of nature that we can all really learn from. Thank you very much for this uh, new point. And I believe that, uh, Julianne, uh, you would like to make a comment as well. So please come in. Well, I don't see her anymore. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, yeah, you're here. Yeah, please go ahead. Thanks. It's a bit disconcerting because I can't see myself, but I can trust. Uh, I trust that you see me. Uh, so thanks so much for this. I think there are a few things that were heartening for me. Is um, as I'm approaching being 60 years old, and I'm back where I did my undergraduate degree, um, which was technically a bachelor of science in agriculture, but really I co-created my own degree and created a whole new bachelor of science in the environment as a result of my journey to help make it easier for others. And I've been mentoring and facilitating and I've worked in over 40 countries across five continents, but most of my work has not been recognized or um, compensated financially. And there was something as I was hearing and listening to people speak where I thought, oh, I feel so much more useful or um, that I've been in development as a resource. And I've, I've known that, but I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel that there's an environment and people here that I can connect with and be useful as a middle-aged elder that's been on this path for 30 years. So when I hear Sophia speak, I can feel what she's talking about. And my background, and I teach permaculture internationally, but really it's a holistic permaculture. And really what we're looking at is how do we see and learn to re-see and feel and act in whole systems. And the way I teach permaculture, there's nothing that isn't involved. It's really any and everything that you can think of and each individual person and collective is going to respond in different ways. And how do we continue this process of coming together? So Violetta, I've known about you for a while. It's just been a little slow for us to connect, but I, I thank you very much for this. I think that it's heartening complexity, holism, and this process of reconnecting. Um, I'm, I'm very much willing to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much for this very heartfelt uh, messaging as well. Um, we see Derek wants to come in too. We are approaching the end of today's session, but Derek, please come in, but please also be short. Come in, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Valletta. Uh, what I wanted to say basically was, uh, I think there was one uh, key topic that we couldn't touch base on. That was uh, what are the good case practices, you know, for financing the developments of uh, this 
you know, concepts in terms mm-hmm. of smart villages. And you know, uh, I've been working on models that are really uh, viable in terms of curating resources that mm-hmm. could be used to develop, a, you know, a city or communities that are centric to, uh, you know, specific use cases. So mm-hmm. what I wanted to share was uh, there are a few ways to reach, you know, uh, resources within the boundaries of smart villages could be curated and then used for the developments or used to build a comprehensive infrastructure uh, layout for f- further developments of these villages. Mm-hmm. And this goes in the context of uh, capitals, right? And I'll just start based on eight forms of these capitals and then the currencies that they, 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 you know, they project as well as what they complex to in terms of uh, our social, social sphere, right? Now, mm-hmm. the first capital is social capital that comes in the form of uh, the currency connections. That is, you know, the influence and in the relationships that you have within uh, the community. The second capital would be the material capital, which, uh, you know, has its currencies as a natural resource and then complex to tools, buildings, and infrastructure. We have the financial capital that is literally money, right? And complex to financial securities and then all these financial instruments. We have living capital that has its currency uh, sequestered in carbon, nitrogen, water. And then this can be complex to soil, living organisms, land, ecosystems, and services. Then we have intellectual capital, which comes in the form of the currency as idea and knowledge, and then also complex to words, images, intellectual property, patents, etc. We have experiential capital, which has its currency embodied in action. And this could also be transcended through experiences and wisdom. We have spiritual capital that comes uh, in the currency of prayer, intentions, faith, karma, and literally could be embodied in what we call spiritual attainment. Then we have the cultural capital, which is the last one. And the currency for this could be a song, a story, a ritual, right? What is, a, what is a, the, the, the song or the story behind creating eco-civilization? And the story complex with something that is literally the community, right? The community. So if we are trying to, let's say, build a system that leverages all these resources and then puts them into, uh, you know, adequate uh, use to reach, you know, the people that are contributing the resources are, you know, leveraged, they are incentivized, they are growing on a daily basis, they are evolving because they are actually putting all these things in place. So I'll just make a, let me say, give a a brief example of the structure using six individuals, right? And these six individuals, I'll name A, B, C, D, and E. So let's Mm -hmm. say individual A is a, let's say a capital partner, right? And a capital partner in that sense means they, uh, you know, have access to investment funds and things like that. Eric, I hate to interrupt you, but we are already three minutes over the time. So um, I would be very happy. Oh, uh, Alexander was much more efficient than I was. So he captured all your points and uh, he just published them. So this is great. And uh, we hope to engage with you uh, again in a more, even maybe more operational level. Uh, because obviously you are deeply into uh, this topic and you have a lot of experiences and also very systemic view over how to approach to this topic. So sorry to interrupt you, but thank you very much really for uh, being so uh, prudent and share with us uh, all uh, all your findings. So I'm, I'm really hoping to bring you back. Uh, and um, we can engage again. So my dear colleagues, my dear friends, uh, this journey was uh, really rich. And uh, just looking at the notes that we created, uh, we really managed to uh, capture a lot of different dimensions that are important in the emergence of our future societies where obviously rural areas have an important role to play. So uh, I hope, uh, I think we missed maybe one question or two. So I'm very much apologizing to everyone who maybe didn't get uh, the direct answers. So please get back to directly get in contact with speakers and get even more enlightened uh, and uh, maybe connected. And as we see, um, Julian already 
offered her uh, contacts uh, to work with her in the future. Um, what I would like to invite maybe uh, Lambert and Ramit and maybe even Dr. Uh, Oshok and Alexander, maybe we can bring this to the attention of UNESCO and uh, ensure that rural areas are equally represented as the smart cities are. Um, because as we all learn through the pandemic, uh, cities without uh, strong rural areas, without fresh food, without uh, well-designed logistic networks that can connect these uh, two entities, um, we're lost, you know? Uh, so I think that it's really important we bring attention to rural areas and that we do understand that smart is not only digital, but smart means also being wise. Smart means also working with the laws of nature, uh, learning from the nature. And, and finally, uh, as Alexander said, uh, remember, uh, claim remembership of the natural systems. So uh, all that can be done through a fresh approach to rural areas, which uh, we unjustifiably try to push aside um, as uh, the development of the future um, of our species. Uh, as we're learning today, uh, it is actually the essence of our future development. So thank you again uh, to all of the speakers. You were uh, really excellent sharing your personal experiences. We saw that uh, from all continents of this beautiful planet Earth, oh, we have some very similar points. Uh, of course, we have some points of diversity which actually makes us rich and uh, even more curious to engage. So I hope this is not the last uh, time. I see that the interest in smart villages is growing and um, we will make sure that eco-civilization uh, creates a proper space for this topic to evolve further. So thanks a lot and see you next time.